We're starting a new series today. This is the first Sunday in a season that the church has called Lent for generations. And so we're going to be taking a look at a very important series, um, a particular set of messages that are going to focus on something by their nature is important, and that is famous last words. Because when you think about last words, there's just something by nature that makes them important. They're the last words. Now sometimes, sometimes, last words are more predictive. There's something about that's going to happen. Like you get a bunch of guys together on a Saturday night and they're bored and you hear one of them say something like, hey, watch this. Last words. We didn't wear helmets when I was a kid. We didn't have to wear seatbelts when I was a kid. We didn't have to cook pork to 160 degrees when I was a kid. Let's play real life Frogger. Ah, look, mushrooms. Ah, look, berries. Ah, look, stagnant water. Why else would they call them parachute pants? Right? You you know, you have famous last words, you know, these kind of things. Now, someone came up to me the other day and said, Frank, you haven't told a joke in a while, which is probably true. I know you guys love my humor, and it is Valentine's Day. So I'm going to give you a joke today that is more of like a last words kind of warning like these. Things that you don't want to say and don't want to put in your Valentine's Day card, okay? So this is a joke that you don't want to try at home, but I'm a professional, so we can handle this. Did you know that the words, it will cost you an arm and a leg, have a theological background? Did you know that? It will cost you an arm and a leg has a theological background. Way back in the book of Genesis, when God made Adam, he put him in the garden and he was all alone. And he goes to to, uh, God one day and says, God, I'm bored. You have nothing to do. This is before they invented the Xbox. So Adam is there all alone and God says, "I'll, I'll fix that for you. I will create for you the perfect woman. She'll be intelligent, gorgeous, beautiful. She'll cook for you. She'll clean for you. She'll bring you snacks during the big game. Um, she won't say a negative word to you. It'll be perfect. And Adam said, man, that just sounds too good to be true. What's it going to cost me? And God said, an arm and a leg. To which Adam replied, well, that's kind of steep. What can I get for a rib? <laughs> See, don't try that at home. Like I said, that's, that's just for the professionals. Okay. In, in all seriousness, though, to be serious, Last words are important. If we ever have the privilege or the honor to hear someone's last words, what do we do? We kind of lean in. We get close. We want to hear what are they going to say? What last message do they want to leave for us or somebody else? Are they going to sum up their life somehow? And so over generations, the church has venerated and paid really super close attention to the last words of Jesus. As his life ebbs away on the cross, we listen in to what he says. Now before we go any further, let's admit something just for a second. This is uncomfortable. This season that like we call Lent, when we kind of focus in on the crucifixion of Jesus, it's an uncomfortable time. We don't necessarily want to be here, especially when we realize the part that we play, you and I play, in Jesus' death. We want to kind of think happy thoughts about Jesus, focus on the good stories, the parables, or when he made dinner for everybody, that kind of stuff, but the Bible won't let us do that. Instead, it's going to go into detail about his trial, about the trumped up charges, about his friends who abandoned him and ran off into the night, about his beatings and his imprisonment, about him carrying this big beam of wood on his back through the streets, being laughed at and humiliated and eventually dying. And at the center of all of this, we see someone who we've come to know as a friend, Jesus. Now the Bible doesn't really give us all the gruesome details. Instead, when it comes to this critical moment in history, it simply says three words, and they they crucified him. 
They crucified him. And it doesn't need any more detail than that. We know what they're talking about. Instead, what the Bible focuses on is what he says, his words. What mattered most to Jesus? What would his final message be? And so we lean in to listen. So we're going to spend a few weeks looking at these final words of Jesus. We start with the first one today. It's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. It says, two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. His first words from the cross are words of pardon. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's unexpected. Crucifixion, by the way, was not a strange thing. If you're coming into a major Roman city, most likely you're going to pass a lot of people, tens, maybe hundreds, being crucified. It was kind of like a deterrent. It's like, if you come to this town and you mess up, you get in trouble, you'll end up like these guys. It was a warning to all those coming into the city. And so ancient historians like Seneca and Cicero said that people who were being crucified would often curse the day of their birth, or they would curse the executioner, or they'd yell at people as they come on by, or they'd spit on them. It was this, they were mean, and they were suffering, and they were angry. When Jesus was crucified, his critics were there too. They heard him say stuff like, forgive or love your enemies, turn the other cheek. And they thought, now, now we're going to see his true colors. As he sits there dying, we're going to see what he's all about. Everybody said something when they were crucified. But I don't think anybody expected what Jesus says here. Forgive them, Father. Forgive them. Now, who is he saying to forgive? The Roman soldiers who were there just doing their job. The Jewish courts that had the trumped up charges and the mock trial. How about the guy who struck him in Caiaphas' court for no good reason? How about Pilate, the politician who would rather see Jesus suffer knowing he's innocent than get himself in trouble with the local folks and ruin his political career? How about Judas? He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Or Peter, who ran and hid. He said, I'll never betray you, Jesus. Nope, not me. I'm there for you, brother. And he takes off running when things get tough. How about the folks that said, we hear your message, but we really don't care. Whatever. Forgive them. How about the folks maybe that ran off in the night, his disciples, when things got tough? Or the people that were just there in the marketplace, not caring, not paying attention. How about them? That's a pretty long list, isn't it? But I dare say that if you're here today, you wish it's a little bit longer. You hope that it includes you and me on that list. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, man, I've got baggage. I've got stuff that I'm carrying around in my life. I've got these difficulties and I just, I can't see how God can say that to me. He does. He does. He says it to you. Father, forgive them. And you're on that list. In 1988, Margaretina Lasky was a British atheist. She was being interviewed toward the end of her life. And she said this, What I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. We want to be forgiven. Down deep, in the middle of the night, when we look at ourselves, we think, man, if someone could forgive me like this. Maybe that's your question today. Well, there's actually probably two questions that we're going to ask about this simple word of Jesus. The first is this. Is that kind of forgiveness possible for you and me? Is it really 
possible that God can forgive like this? And the second question is this. Was all this really necessary? Now, I want to start with that second question, actually. I mean, if God forgives, could God just say, you're forgiven? Can he just like say, you know what? Come here, give me a hug. We'll call it all good. Does he have to go through this suffering with his son? Does Jesus have to die? In 2 Corinthians, Paul says it like this. For our sake, he made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He says to us, he made Jesus to be sin embodied. Why? For you and me. Is that possible for us? And why did that have to happen? Couldn't God have just waved it off? Well, we're gonna look at that second question first. Was it necessary? And to do that, look at your own life. If you've ever forgiven somebody, you know it's gonna cost you something, right? Forgiveness is gonna cost you. It's always costly. In Luke chapter seven, Jesus is talking to one of the Pharisees named Simon who he wasn't really happy with. And you see Jesus kind of compare um, forgiveness to a debt, to money. It had some economic value. And he talks to this guy named Simon and he says, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, two people who owed him something. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them loved more? So, it's a debt, right? It's money. It's an exchange of money. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, what do we, there's some translation that says, forgive us our debts, right? As we forgive our debtors. Now, we have teens and some kids in here this morning. Let me put it to you this way. Let's say, for example, you're a teenager and you want to borrow my truck because it's way cool, okay? It's got crank windows. It's got manual locks it's got a manual transmission but it's not a chevy so it's got that's a dodge but you want to borrow it because you want to carry something right so you go to my house i give you the keys you get in my truck you put it in gear pop the clutch bang goes in the back wall put a big old hole in my block wall but then you freak out you get scared put it in first pop the clutch again boom you get to my garage not my garage door in on stacy's car so we come out and like, hey, what's going on? Well, I kind of ruined your house. Well, all right, you're polite, you know, I'm polite, we're all good, but your insurance is kind of off, right? You're between insurance carriers, and now we're left with two possible outcomes. Either A, you're gonna pull out your checkbook, or your parents will, and write a check for the damages, right? Or B, I'm gonna say, oh man, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm good. I'll take care of myself. That's your two options, right? Either you're going to pay or I'm going to pay. But the bottom line is somebody is going to pay for those damages. Now that's kind of simple when it comes to a broken fence and a smashed garage door. But what about when someone destroys your happiness? Or what about when someone ruins your reputation? Or they say terrible things about you or make fun of you at school? You have the same two options. You can either A, try to make them pay. You want to make them suffer. Maybe ruin their reputation back. Maybe say things behind their back. Make them feel the pain that you felt. Maybe do it subtly. You just give them the cold shoulder. Unfriend them on Facebook. That'll show them. You do, you do stuff that kind of just shows them that you're upset and you want them to suffer and feel a little bit of what you did. What happens when you do that? Does the debt get paid? No, it never gets paid like that. Instead, what happens is you become hard, you become cold, you become bitter, and that begins working on you. It destroys your character. The debt doesn't go away. Or you can make the payment. We call that forgiveness. Tim Keller is an author, and he wrote this. He said, forgiveness means refusing to make them pay for what they did. He goes on to say, 
However, listen to this. To refrain from lashing out at someone when you, do, when you want to do so with all your being is agony. It is a form of suffering. You not only suffer the original loss of happiness, reputation, and opportunity, but now you forego the consolation of inflicting the same on them. You are absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person. It hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels like a kind of death. Sound familiar? God did that on a cosmic scale for you and for me. He forgives. And not only that, not only does he forgive us, he can forgive us when others won't. He says, Father, forgive them. And that cost Jesus something. Ron Davis, in his book called A Forgiving God and an Unforgiving World, tells a true story about a Philippines minister. Really well-liked guy. But he had this one thing that bothered him. Way back when he was in seminary, he committed this kind of bad sin. And although he prayed for forgiveness and he repented, it still hung with him. Well, there's this woman in our church who's a very, very godly woman. And she said that she had visions at night sometimes where she would actually talk to Jesus. Well, he was kind of skeptical. He's like, yeah, that sounds kind of crazy to me. And so what happens is he goes to her and says, I'll tell you what, next time you talk to Jesus, you ask him about that sin, that secret sin that no one knows about that I committed in seminary. Ask him about that. She says, okay, I will. And so he sees her a little later and says, have you talked to Jesus at night? She says, yeah, I have. Did you ask him about my secret sin from back in seminary days? She said, yeah, I did. Well, what was it? What did Jesus say that it was? She said, when I asked Jesus, he said, I don't remember. Forgiveness is like that. He doesn't remember. That leads us to the second point. Is that kind of forgiveness possible for you and for me? Go back to our story. I told you a story from Luke 7 where these two guys owed 550 denarii and about being forgiven for that huge debt they couldn't pay. That story is in a larger story. And that larger story is about a woman. Jesus is at this party. Who's in, he's invited by Simon the Pharisee to this party. And he's sitting there at this party. And a woman is going to show up. Now they're sitting there at a place that's called a triclinium. It's like a big room with three sides. And they're all leaning in, facing the middle where there's food. And they're eating and talking. And this woman comes in off the street. In Luke 7, that's what happens. And a woman in the city who was a sinner having learned that he was eating with, at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, she said to himself, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him that she is a sinner. We don't know her name, do we? We have no clue. What we do know is that everyone knew that she was a sinner. That's how they knew her. That's how the Bible labels her. This woman, you know, the sinning one. That's who she is. And she shows up to anoint Jesus' feet. And you have to ask the question, why? Why is she there? Well, there's two possible reasons. Number one, She's there because she wants something. She knows he's a prophet. She knows he's someone special. He does miracles. So she so, shows up with this expensive ointment to anoint his feet because she wants something. Or she's there because she's already met Jesus and she wants to thank him for something. Which do you think it is? Because she shows up and her intention is to anoint him. That's it. Anoint his feet where no one can see. Kind of go in the back. Back door, slip behind. Anoint his feet. But then it says she begins to weep. And that, I don't think, was intentional. I don't think she planned on that. I think she got there and was so overcome that she began to weep. She had no towel. She didn't bring a towel. All she had was her hair. She used her hair to wipe his feet off because she didn't intend to be weeping. 
I think what happened was, sometime earlier, Jesus forgave her. This woman who was a sinner, who everyone saw as a sinner, everyone knew as a sinner, he came to her and said, you're forgiven. And she felt it, and she knew it, and when she saw him, she broke down to tears. Didn't intend for that to happen, but it did. Father, forgive them. And she expresses that gratitude by taking care of Jesus. After scolding Simon the Pharisee for the way he treated her, Jesus said this, verse 47, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, he doesn't ignore it, but her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Our lives should reflect the forgiveness that God offers us, like it does with her. Ernest Gordon was a Presbyterian dean at the chapel at Princeton. But he's also Scottish, and he was also a prisoner of war in World War II. He was one of the men who helped build the bridge over the River Kwai. And he wrote a book called Miracle at the River Kwai. So here are these men who are suffering. They're working in 100 degree heat, they're prisoners, their feet are cut up from the rocks, they're dying of disease and starvation and malnutrition. He says it was a horrible, terrible place these prisoners were as they worked day after day. Well, one day, he says, they were coming back from their work detail, all on the line, struggling just to walk, and one of the Japanese soldiers says that they are missing a shovel. They did a checkpoint and missing a shovel. And the soldier goes off the hook. He is just furious. He says, I'm going to kill every single one of you. Who stole the shovel? Puts up his rifle at the first guy in line, intending to kill him. And then from the back, one man steps out and says, I did it. I stole the shovel. And the Japanese soldier flies into a rage and beats the man to death right there on the way. They carry him back to the camp and they get back to the camp and they do another check of the tools and they find out there was never a missing shovel. There was a miscount at the checkpoint. And all these soldiers began to realize that one of their own an innocent man stepped forward and was willing to die for the rest of them. And he said he remembered, Ernest Gord remembered this verse, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. He said that moment was the miracle. It changed these men. They began to show compassion for each other. They began to perform burials for each other put crosses at the graves. He said, robbery and thieving between them stopped that day. They found ways to help each other. And then later when the allies showed up and liberated the camp, the allies come into camp and they see all these men like skeletons just starving to death and they become angry at what they see, how their friends were being treated, how their fellow soldiers were treated. And they wanted to go and just kill the Japanese soldiers right there on the spot. And these prisoners of war said, no. No, there's been enough death. There's been enough suffering. Now is the time to forgive. At the cross, God's richest grace and our deepest need met. God's richest grace and our deepest need met there at the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. And now, may we act like we have been a forgiven people and to show that forgiveness, that grace to others. Let's pray together.